first of all, I just want to say thanks for coming on here. I appreciate it. When I when I first came in, um, there you and uh, and Marty were like our generation's uh, go to guys. Like you were our, our role models. Like when I first came in, it was like Lucas and Cross over at first bat were just crushing. And so I can't thank you enough for coming on here. I really look up to you. And you guys over at first bat really set a good example for all of us to kind of strive for. You were good role models for for us young guys at, in the beginning. So I appreciate you coming on. I was looking through your bio. I, I already knew that you were. Um, you guys crushed over at first bet, but then after that, you just you like kind of skyrocketed and uh, did some great things. So, um, yeah, if you want to uh, first take us, you know, in the beginning, uh, kind of what got you into the military and then uh, take us through your career. Yeah. So uh, thanks for the kind words. That's that's really cool. Um, makes me feel like I actually did something. <laughs> uh, yeah. So for me, uh, the military thing was was pretty easy. Right. I grew up watching all the different. Uh, World War II movies, the the Rat Patrol, things of that nature. Right. And uh, when I was in high school, I knew I was mature enough to know I wasn't mature enough to go to college. Right. Uh, so the drinking age back in New York back then was 18. Uh. And uh, if you're 16 with long hair, you can get into the rock clubs. <laughs> so, <Right. laughs> uh, I, so that was really the, the, the genesis. I just knew... I wasn't ready to go to college. Um, and so I, I enlisted December 30th of 1980. Uh, I was 17. Uh, my parents, the recruiter comes to the house and he says, Mr. And Mrs. Cross, uh, you know, your son wants to join the Air Force. We'd love to have him. However, uh, he's not old enough to sign. We need you to sign for him. And before he could finish saying, I need you to sign, my father was reaching for the pen. <laughs> so I think my father was ready to help me along my path. Get you on the um, way. Yeah. Get me on the way. And then it was a nine month delayed enlistment. Uh, and what was interesting about uh, things back then was that nine, nine months delayed enlistment counted towards pay. Okay. Is, which was kind of cool. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, you know, graduate uh, summer of uh, spring 81, uh, worked in a die cast uh, factory making aluminum molds and things of that nature for the summer. And then in September, basic training and then uh, security police back then security police, uh, security specialist uh, tech school. Okay. Uh, that was kind of cool. Or so I thought it was. And I did two years at Aviano, Italy. Lovely three years in Maine. Nice enough. But uh, I saw this airman magazine uh, and on the front cover was this guy named Dan Hannigan. And Dan Hannigan was all camoed up with a, I think he still had his, he had his Ranger tab then and he had a Recondo tab. Okay. And I'm like, who the fuck is this guy? <laughs> right. And so I start doing research and then, uh, uh, so it would have been about probably 86. And I'm, I start looking into cross training and I looked at the, uh, Combat controller and, and back then tactical air command and control specialist, of course, now TAC P. Right. And I initially was going for the combat control school because I knew everybody there went to jump school. Yeah. And when I called down to the TAC P schoolhouse, they were like, oh, no, we only get two slots per class. So I'm trying to hedge my bets. Uh, but by the time the physical, the class three flying physical and the air traffic controller physical came back, uh, and I was a staff sergeant at that time, um, uh, the slots for the combat controller uh, for cross trainees closed. Uh, so I ended up going TAC-P. And, and I'm doing all the PT that uh, I got from the combat control schoolhouse. And I, I had this vision in my head. I said, this is, oh, so I'm like, okay, so I'm an E5. I'm going to go down to tech school as a, to this tech layer command and control specialist thing. And I said, oh, um, I outranked the other students, so I think I have a little more experience and more discipline uh, because they said it's a it's a merit order based way to get to jump school. Right. Right. You got to have the grades. You got to be the PT guy. And so I'm counting on my maturity or sort of speak maturity <laughs> and, and the fact that I'm actually preparing for this. So I get down there. And it's all 24 students are cross trainees. Oh, man. And I'm like, 
not me. <laughs> so there were three staff sergeants. There was a guy named uh, Jose Ortiz. Okay. Um, but he was already jump qualified because he tried to go combat controller, and for whatever reason, that didn't work out. Oh, okay. Uh, there was Terry Langley, yeah. and then there was myself, and all the rest were buck sergeants or senior airmen because you know, okay. we had the buck sergeants back then. And so I'm looking around, and I'm like, gosh. <laughs> well, unbeknownst to me, not everybody wanted to go to jump school. Yeah. Who knew? Yeah. And so, so I'm like, well, son of a biscuit. So, and some, somebody somewhere, and I forget who it was, says, if you've ever been knocked unconscious, the Air Force won't let you jump. So when we're in class on like the first or second day, Johnny Kleber, Clay Christian, and Ray Carvalho are the instructors. Okay. And they come in and they're like, hey, who here has ever been knocked unconscious? So a couple guys raise their hands. And they say, who here has uh, already PCS'd, right? So somehow they actually PCS'd from their prior unit, prior career field to their new detachment for attack P. And uh, they said, okay. Then they asked, who wants to go to jump school? And so anybody who raised their hand for unconscious or already PCS'd were knocked out of the running. Oh, okay. So there was four of us. There was me, Steve Stangl. Uh, Joel Hockenden and uh, uh, what was it? Frank Frank Purcell. Okay. Uh, rest his soul. And uh, so we just, you know, from there we just PT'd and and uh, I did the academics well. And so myself and Steve Stengel got the two jump slots. Oh, uh, right on. Yeah. So that was that was kind of cool. But uh, yeah. And, and again, there was only like six, seven dudes who raised their hands, and I was like, oh. Doesn't everybody want to go to jump school? Yeah, it's, yeah, guess, exactly. That's the way I, I thought when not. I went through too. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so, so that was uh, uh, me getting into the to the TACP career field. I, you know, I saw stuff. The the security forces, well, back then, security police, security specialist wasn't exactly what I thought it was going to be. Right. Did my five plus years and then cross trained. Nice. And, and you know, ever since then, it's been a wild ride. Yeah. So what your first assignment out of tech school, where'd you end up going after that with your, just say you went through, I assume you went to tech school, then jump school and then your yeah. next assignment. Okay. Yeah. And, and so they sent me to a uh, detachment to 507 tech air control wing, which was down at Fort Stewart, um, which was interesting because they, uh, uh, it was first and second brigade in the 24th infantry division mechanized. Okay. Uh, was the unit that was there and come to find out that two had two uh augmentees for the fellows up at, in savannah right. at uh operate location alpha alpha uh which was really just serendipitous it, it worked out perfect so i was on jump status uh then uh marty came in behind me and he was on jump status he was actually there before i got there but he went to jump school after i arrived and so we would go up to shaw air force base and jump out of the uh, ch3s Nice. Which was a really fun jump. Yeah. Um, and so I did the debt two thing for maybe about a year and four months. And then I PCS up to Savannah. Nice. Spent about seven and a half years up in Savannah, uh, working with first bat. Who was there when you got there? Uh, was it, was it you, Marty and J Mac at the, at the time or was it? There... Yeah. So, um, uh, I replaced Tom Kotcher okay. cause he PCS out. And Marty replaced Keith Ingram, yeah, because uh, he PCS down. And then J Mac, of course, was was up there, right, right. And and so we we were there for. So I got there in November '88, and Marty got there, and I think February '89. Okay. And then J Mac ended up PCS in like one October, uh, okay. down to San Antonio. And so what's interesting is that on one October is when I graduated Ranger School. Okay. So for just one day. We were the first uh, TAC P unit that had all their enlisted dudes, Ranger qualified, <laughs> just right for on. one day. One day. <laughs> one day. And well, tell, uh, yeah, tell me more about that. Tell me about. I I, I really want to hear about Panama, obviously. But then, like, tell me about that time before Panama. Like, how did how was all how was training with the Rangers? I know it's probably a lot different than when I did it, and then also probably way different than it is now. You know. Yeah. So it was. So when we think about the, the physical fitness standards, so back in the day, we'd show up at the office 
Uh, we'd look at each other, go for, you know, three to five mile run, a pretty fast clip back then. Uh, you know, we're doing a seven minute, at least in my mind, uh, about a seven minute for the, uh, for the, for the five and, you know, maybe a, a six thirty seven for the, for, uh, maybe a three miler. And then, you know, a little bit slower for the five and, uh, we'd come over, do some push ups, sit ups, pull ups, sit down, put our feet up and drink coffee. Okay. Right on. <laughs> you know, and then I look at what the guys are doing today and, and they're, they're just so phenomenally fit, even in the, uh, what we might call the, the conventional units. Oh, right, right. You know, I'm over here in, in El Paso. I see the guys at, at the seventh day house at Fort Bliss, the hustlers. And I look at these guys and I say, good God, they are just so fit. Yeah. Um, but back then, oh, and ruck marching, did a lot of ruck marching sure, with the sure. battalion or, you know, with our respective companies. Uh, but we did a lot of basically direct action type missions where we'd, you know, fly in or jump in or do an air land, hit the objective, uh, open it up for some other uh, unit to come in and do their thing. Right. And then they pull out, we'd collapse the objective and, and get boogie out. And, and we did a couple conventional style stuff where we jumped in and walked for a couple days and uh, you know, hit, hit an objective and then we'd, you know, AAR and all that. And then we'd get on buses and head back home. Right. Right. Uh, and, but, but what I, what I liked about it was you, you had the sense that all of the scenarios, all the training was actually geared towards something we might be tasked to do. Right. And, and of course, in fact, that's what happened with, with Panama. Uh, I remember we did a, uh, we did a mission down at, at Duke field. So we fly, jump, uh, load on buses, and I was I was studying for a biology test. Okay. Because <laughs> I was taking, I was working on my associate's degree with St. Leo. And so I'm studying, I'm sleeping, studying, eating, sleeping, studying, you know, on a bus ride all the way from Duke to Hunter Army Airfield. Yeah. And, uh, and I remember it was, uh, <laughs> it was 17 December. I just watching, finished watching uh, uh, It's a Wonderful Life with Jimmy Stewart. Okay. Uh, I'm changing a shit diaper on my one-month-old baby, <laughs> and the phone rings. And it was this guy, uh, Major Gary Luck. Yeah. And we had all these code words, right? And he gets on the phone. He's like, you got to come in now. <laughs> I'm like, where's the code words? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and I'm like, roger that, sir. You know, I didn't ask any questions. I just went in. Uh, and then, of course, uh, uh, three days later, uh, we're, we're jumping in, right? 20 yeah. December, uh, like 003 in the morning, we're jumping in uh, to Panama. And I, I thought what was interesting uh, afterwards was, you know, you get back and everybody's like, oh, how was it? Did you shoot anybody? Did somebody shoot at you? All this kind of stuff. And I said, well, that's, you know, I, I answered, uh, you know, just like, hey, it wasn't a big deal. You know, inside looking out, not a big deal. Just did a, what I and I did. I did feel good about that. I reacted the way I should have. Right. And uh, but then I went home uh, to New York, and I'm at the house, and my father, who's never been associated with the military in any way, uh, he says to me, he says, uh, "So he go, how was it compared to your training?" Right. Good and question. I thought, that yeah. was, uh, absolutely germane. To, to the whole situation. Sure. And, and I thought for just like a nanosecond, I'm like, you know what, Pop, with the exception of somebody literally shooting back, it was exactly like the training. Yeah. And so kudos to the Rangers for just really uh, doing things the right way in training. Sure. Right. So that was that was a really reflective moment for me. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I felt the same way when I was when I was there, like when we when we initially went into Afghanistan, it was like we, it was the same thing we had been doing for like, you know, months and months and years and years before. So I, yeah, I can relate to it. So, which is, yeah, yeah. like you said, it's a testament to the Rangers. They train exactly how they fight, which is phenomenal. I, I used yeah, to love and, that. And they, they have an idea about what may or may not happen in the world. And, and so they gear the training and their training scenarios towards that. Right. 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 And I, and I don't know if some of the conventional forces do, or if they're just uh, more focused on their metal. All right. Right. They, kind of look forward to what may happen in the world and then they kind of train to that. And then when it does right. happen, they're ready for it. Yeah. Right. Right. So, you know, and of course they're tied into in, Intel and all that. And, you know, I mean, the higher ups have an idea. I had no idea. Right. Right. 
Yeah. When, when we when we did our rehearsal at Duke Field, I had no idea what was around the corner. Yeah. yeah. You know, so surprise. <laughs> <laughs> You did know, you it, um, it, did you find that you went to you had a couple different uh, like kind of false um, recalls like you they call you in and then nothing would happen and you went home and did you ever go through a couple of those before the Panama invasion or was it just this was it and bam you're gone no so I got a I had just gotten there and I got a call I just it must have been I don't even know um, November December of '88 maybe. And I got a call, come on in. I'm like, oh, so I go in and uh, we actually, uh, uh, are you familiar with Sabre Hall? Uh, yeah. 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 So, so we get bivouacked over there and we know kid, we did some uh, helo type of mission down again, this time again to Duke Field, but it was helos. Wow. Oh, that's a long ass ride. I was going to say. Helicopter. <laughs> yeah. Uh, 53s. <laughs> okay. Um. And so we do that. And, and so that happened and no, no other recalls than Panama happens. Um, and then for a desert storm, we were told on a Friday, uh, you need to be here tomorrow morning at this hour. Right. And so that's when we went in and we got all our desert stuff, loaded some 141s, uh, flew uh, to Kuwait and jumped into Kuwait. Oh, right on. And uh, uh, it, it, what it, it was is it, it still was within the time frame of Desert Storm, um, but really all the U.S. troops had gone back home for the oh, most okay. part, except for what they were fixing to start up in uh, at, at Camp Doha, which later they transferred over to Arif John. Um, you know all the support stuff for the the no fly zones and things of that nature. Yeah, yeah. and. Uh, uh, so we fly in, and really what it was was now Saddam, all the troops go home, so Saddam starts rattling his saber again. Okay. And so we just did a no-notice Idri. Uh, flew all the way there, uh, jumped in, and maybe 23 knot winds. Um, uh, uh, that's um, uh, Marty actually dislocated his shoulder on that jump. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, uh, and I remember hitting the ground and, and just bouncing and being drugged and got – wrapped up in the, in the, the heart, the cape roll and all that good stuff. And, oh. and I'm laying there and I'm just nice and quiet, just trying to assess myself. And this young kid comes running over, Hey, Sergeant Cross, are you all right? And I'm like, <laughs> no, I'm not Get the fuck away from me. You know? <laughs> and so he just goes bouncing off, you know, cause the younger guys are more pliable. <laughs> right. Right. And, uh, and so we did that. And then we, we road marched from, uh, Ali Al Salem up to Yadari. Okay. Uh, did a live fire exercise. Chris Brewer was with us then. Uh, did a live fire exercise where we, the whole battalion got online, slung lead into Udari. Nice. And then back to Camp Doha we go. Wow. And so that was like the basically the third. And then the fourth one was when we were hanging around the, uh, we were at work and they send, they used to send runners, right? And yeah, unho yeah. unhook all the phones. <laughs> right, right. Right. And uh, the next thing you know, like the next day, we're getting on helicopters and, and flying over to the USS America uh, for Haiti, for oh, a right, democracy. Right. Um, actually, that was the last time I saw Brian Daly because he was there with RRD oh, okay. uh, on the boat. So it was, it was me, Chris Brewer, and, and Toby Lofton for that one. And I saw Roger Hovis over on Gitmo. So, well, but, tell me uh, about that. Like, I, I haven't heard much about Haiti. Um, I know a couple of guys. I know... I had talked to a couple of guys that said they were over there, but I never heard any details. Did, did you have any, like, well, how was that? What was that like? It was a novelty at first being on a boat. <laughs> yeah. But after 37 days, it got old. Oh, I'll bet. <laughs> but, you know, the cool thing is, is, is I'm an Air Force guy who got two months of sea pay and tax-free pay. Nice. So that was kind of cool. <laughs> um, and I, I could, so I could tell you we were, we did a rehearsal for Haiti down at Herbert Field. Okay. And I forget exactly how far in advance, because um, we did a lot of helicopter missions. They, they set up all kinds of mock stuff on the Eglin range, like they did with the Sante Raiders for, for the Sante Raid. Yeah. Um, so we did that rehearsal, and, uh, and I remember they were checking. So we, the body armor is pretty new. And so they, they got two of our biggest guys in Charlie Company 
put them in the body armor, put the, the LPUs under them to see if they would float. Oh, okay. You know, because you can't take that for granted, right? Yeah, no kidding. You and want to find uh, out so, when you're in the water already. <laughs> yeah. So they, they, they kitted these two big guys up, uh, put the body armor on them and, and put the LPUs and tossed them in the water. And good enough, right? <laughs> they didn't drown. So oh, that's good. Yeah. Uh, but the Haiti thing was kind of cool because we're on the boat. Um, it was a Jesodif. Uh, so there were other folks on the boat with us, but it was first bat, one company from second bat. Um, and I know third bat was fixing to fly and jump. And I'm sitting on the boat and I'm like, that motherfucker Marty's going to get a second combat star. <laughs> Son of a bitch. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and so uh, we were there for a few days. Um, and then we all kitted up and we were in the hangar bay. And they bring the elevator down. And we have we have the helicopter unit up on the deck, and they start bringing dudes up. Okay. And then they they called it off. And uh, then we did it the second day. Uh, we went to go do it again, and they called it off again. And of course, what had happened was you had uh, Senator Nunn and former President Carter and, and Powell yeah. were down there talking with the president of Haiti, and and basically they're saying, hey, we've got have we got a deal for you. And oh, by the way, you see the 82nd Airborne Division. Now, of course, it's not the whole division, but right. they don't know that. Yeah, they don't know. <laughs> so you got the 82nd Airborne Division taking off, and they're gonna they're gonna fly and jump onto Haiti, and they're gonna be on you guys like ants on a Jolly Rancher. So, what do you want to do? And so, because of those three folks, we we didn't have to actually go into combat operations in Haiti. Okay. And so they facilitated a smooth uh, transition of power, as it were, uh, in gotcha. Haiti. Okay. Um, but, you know, 37 days on the boat, you know, then we went over to Gitmo to, to unload all our, our ammo. You know, they set up a firing range, so we got to expend all our ammo. And, oh, nice. And then get back on the boat, and, and then we're like, okay, we're out of here. And they're like, oh, no, no, no. The, the, back then they called them commander-in-chiefs. Now they call them the, the combat commanders. Um, the combat commanders are like, hey, uh, we'd like you guys to stay around for a little while. Hence the 37 days. Oh my gosh. And then we just, we just, you know, made our way back up to, off the coast of Savannah. The helicopters flew us back, dropped us off at Sabre Hall, and that was end of mission. But there's like three real world scenarios that had different types of recalls, right? And so, yeah. you know, what you least expect, expect, I guess. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. You just never know. Yeah. Yeah. But it was nice because uh, we were prepared for it, right? Right. You know, so it was nice. There was no scrambling, none of that kind of stuff. Yeah. You kind of there. It's almost that training that in, it's ingrained in you that now you're getting on a helo. Now you're going to hit this yeah. boat. It's like, yeah, all right. I've done, you know, I've done it hundreds of times. So it's fine. You know, like there's yeah. no surprises. Yeah. No. Yeah. 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 A muscle memory as it were. For sure. Well, do you want to go back to Panama and do you want to talk about your experience there or, um, I don't, I don't want, I don't, I always try to um, ask first because I don't want anybody to feel uncomfortable about, you know, uh, their wartime experience, but um, I'd love to hear yeah. about how, how, how your experience was and, you know, when you guys jumped in. Well, I, I could tell you, uh, again, we're, we're at Sabre Hall and they go out to do sustained airborne training and it's just pissing all over us. Right. And up north at Bragg, they had, they're going, to, they're having ice storms. Oh, man. All right. And I'll, I can get to that in a, a minute. And so what was supposed to happen, we were supposed to jump, and 45 minutes later, the 82nd was supposed to come down with this huge armada. Right. Right? Uh, but what happened was, because of the ice storm, they are de-icing planes and sending them. So they were coming down in ones and twos. Oh. But I was really looking forward to seeing that. <laughs> uh, so anyways, we're doing sustained airborne training. It's pissing all over us. And they, they've finally, somebody said, you know, stop this nonsense. You know, enough. <laughs> so we didn't finish it. Uh, and we went into these, uh, these bathrooms to dry all our shit off. Uh, we lo I loaded a, a, a Salt 2 141, and we just had outboard seats, no inboard seats. It nice. was lovely. Yeah. And, uh, and I was actually on the same bird with Marty. And I remember uh, after waking, you know, because you get on there, you get settled in, you dry off, you warm up, you, you know, what do you do? You sleep. Right. And I remember waking up, and I'm like, <sighs> And I'm, I'm closer to the bulkhead, and Marty's closer to the to the rear of the craft. And I look down, and when I look down, Marty's looking at me. 
And we told that story to his wife, Peg, and she's like, oh, you guys had a moment. And I'm like, the <laughs> fuck we did. Guys don't have moments. So right. back off. <laughs> um, you know, it was just a thing. But uh, so so we do the jump. And 500 feet's a quick ride. Yeah. <laughs> That's all I got to say. It was like <laughs> one, two, three, four, check canopy, drop ruck, hit ground. Man. You know? Um and I remember, you know, so you got the tracers flying, which is, you know, okay. I don't think they're coming towards me, so that's good. Yeah. Hit the ground, pack my, sh- they said, hey, you got to pack your shoot up because of an air land folks coming in later. Right. Okay. So pack the shoot up, um, throw it off the runway and, and make my way towards the, uh, towards our rally point for Charlie Company. So Charlie Company's objective was uh, an airborne company, uh, the okay. Pumas, second Pumas right of the Panamanian Defense Forces. Okay. And so we make our way to the rally point. Uh, Marty's company was Bravo company was responsible for uh, perimeter security of the airfield. Okay. And it was Torrios Tucuman. So it was a military and a civilian. Yeah, they yeah. had two two runways. Uh, J Max company went after the Panamanian uh, uh, version of security police. Okay. And then Mark Talella was down there with Charlie company third bat. And uh, and their objective was the civilian terminal, okay, to secure that because also they were trying to prevent ways for for Noriega to get off to get out, right, to flee, yeah, yeah. And so we hit the ground and and uh, we rally up, make it to our 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 little command post because you know I was hanging with the the FSO FSNCO company commander, and all the line dudes ran out and did their thing. And uh, the FSNCO, uh, Sergeant Wood, his rucksack frapped in. So his Prick 77s is gone. Oh, no. And, uh, and so what happens is we're on the ground. Everything seems to be settled in. And, and guys are out to their – all the line dudes are out where they got to be. And they said, okay, hey, the 80 seconds going to be coming in, onesies and twosies. Now, of course, we jumped blacked out, right? Yeah. Um, but the uh, the eighty second came in and they had red lights, and it was absolutely amazing how well you could see the jumpers in the door. Really, absolutely mind blowing to me. Well, so uh, what happens is the eighty second they're they're just they're they're jumping right, red light, green light, it don't matter. They're getting the hell out of the plane. <laughs> right. And so they ended off DZ. And. Uh, so what happens is, is, uh, I think Marty ended up getting the assets after the initial Charlie company had priority of fires. And then I think Bravo company had it okay. afterwards. And so myself and Sergeant Wood, what we ended up doing, we had, a we had these psyops dudes with us <laughs> and they jumped in these big monster speakers, uh, and they jumped, uh, the, this one guy, he did the, the rehearsal at, at Duke field and then he jumped over to Panama. That was his seventh jump. Jeez. Seventh, his seventh jump was a combat jump. <laughs> Jeez. Sounds like those guys in World War II. <laughs> and so what they did was they set up their speakers and they were like, 82nd Airborne Division, come to the sound of my voice. This is, you know, the 75th Ranger Regiment or 1st Ranger Battalion. So what happened was we started getting all these guys coming out of the jungle. And myself and Sarah Wood, we would walk them out to the airfield and we'd say, Take a left, continue to march, because their assembly area was further south. Okay. And so we spent a, a little bit of time uh, having those guys come to our location, bring them out to the runway or the taxiway, and send them south. Nice. Um, but other than that, then we just we just hung around, yeah. you know. Uh, we ended up going up into the mountains, you know, just to do some patrolling and, and met the villagers and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I can't speak to what Marty or J-Mac did. Right, right. Because they were there as well. Um, But that was it. You know, the initial jump, assemble. Uh, I I did have to laugh the morning after the jump. And and now think about it. There's parachutes up in the trees and all over the place, right? Right. Because the 82nd, like I said, they they were coming on one runway. And as they came across, they just kept coming. Okay. And so this dude comes driving in into the morning. And he looked like... um, he looked like Art Garfunkel with the big hair yeah. and, the, and, the, and he had glasses and dudes are yelling, stop, stop. So they shoot the car up 
and the guy hits the deck, he ducks. So one of the Spanish speaking dudes goes out, starts talking to him. They pull him out of the car. He's fine. He's not a threat. The dude was going to work. He had no idea there'd been an invasion. Oh my God. <laughs> I felt so bad for the guy. I felt yeah. so bad for the guy. He's like, oh, he came so close to like getting smoked just going to yeah. work. Yeah. And they, you know, they just fired up the tires and all that. They, they you know, they're, they're, they're disciplined uh, enough. You know, they weren't, it's not like they were fangs out, you know? So, uh, you know, and then that's it. We just hung out and spent Christmas in Panama and, and, um, uh, guys rigged, uh, what was those? Oh yeah. The, the BA 55 90s, right. Were those the batters? So, so one of the combo whackers hooked those up to a commercial radio. And, and so we got the song, uh, Feliz Navidad beat into our brains. Oh, um, nice. Horrible. Okay. Um, I do remember we went to the town of Pacora to hand out food and gifts and all that to the, to the locals. Oh, nice. Um, you know, uh, Captain Allen was the company commander and, and he ended up becoming the vice chief of staff of the army. Nice. Uh, but, uh, other than that, it, you know, again, I'm on the inside looking out and I did what yeah. I was supposed to do and came home. So how long were you guys down there? Uh, December 20th. I think we flew back on January 4th. Okay. So we were there for fly back together. All, you know, oh yeah. You, okay. All the tech P were all kind of in the same, at the same time, if, if not. All oh yeah. Yeah. Time. Yeah. The, the whole battalion next field at the same time. Okay. Yeah, the the entire and I I can't speak to to we had regimental dudes with us of course and third bat oh. and I don't I don't know if they flew out or not. Okay. So so you got back from that and then um you you, you did man it, so you had a busy time there you had Haiti you had Panama you had mm -hmm. uh, you know Desert Storm. Uh, yeah. So then so you were there you were there quite a long time I know I noticed it was like maybe about eight or ten years or something about seven and a half. Seven and a half. Okay. Yeah. Lundquist, I think had the longest time there at first bat. Okay. So if you ever get to talk to him, he was there eight plus years, I think. Yeah. I'd love to. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Lunk was in uh, Panama when I first got down there. Like he had, um, that's where I met him. He, he was like one of the three dudes that was able to stay in Panama during, after you guys had already secured that and everything. So like he was, uh, he was, uh, supported the first, the 508th down there. Uh, right. Right. That's right, where right. I met him. But yeah. yeah. Do you have anything else from first bat? Did you have any other, any other experiences or any other stories that you want to talk about? Oh man, there? I had some good ones. We, uh, uh, I went, I went to the UK with uh, Charlie company. And, and so we went up to a place called West Fru in Scotland and we did some training with two para. Oh, cool. Um, and then we ended up popping down to Aldershot where they used to be They're They're no longer there in Aldershot. And so we got to go shoot their guns and, and as the Brits say, go out on the piss and have a good time. And, Right. Um, a lovely little establishment called, uh, I think it was called the Rat Hole. That was nice. <laughs> um, and then we got to do a trip to Norway for uh, Arctic Express. Oh, neat. Uh, we did a Bright Star with the oh, whole cool. battalion. Uh, Is that those in, the ones in Egypt? Yep. Yep. So we did, uh, so all, all, that was 93. So that would have been myself, I think Marty and Brewer. Okay. So we would have, we would have gone to, to that one. Um, geez, uh, a couple trips down to Puerto Rico to Vieques Island it was good, but it was busy. It was always busy. It was, and it was such a great assignment as far as self-development, sure. right? Um, yeah. becoming tactically, uh, technically proficient as an individual and learning to work in those smaller, uh, elements that, you know, or, or we would yeah. do cult missions, you know, the combat observation laser team missions, right? Right. Um, which was always a lot of fun, hard, but fun. Yeah, that's the thing I noticed about too. Is like it was super, like difficult. Like it was very, it was yeah. hard work. But then once you're done, it was like, man, that was so cool. That we got to do that. I mean, they, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was so, and and it, right with with, you know, good rewards come with hard work, right? For uh, sure. And and so that was such a great great period of my time. You know. Yeah. As, well, I'm as sure it set the dude. stage for your success in the future. I mean, that just. It has a tendency to do that yeah. for guys. Yeah, it, I think so. The, just the standards and, and the discipline. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and in fact, there was, there's a story of uh, Dave Bickle. Uh, he was at he was at uh, the 14th and myself and Valella were there. He was the squadron soup. I was the op soup. And of course, we brought those standards with us. Right. And Bickle ends up going to Korea. And then he comes back to the 14th as they typically do. 
Yeah. And he came back and he says, you know what, Sergeant Cross? He says, he goes, I used to think you and, and Valella were just, you know, being a pain in the ass, being dicks. And he says, but after seeing some of those guys come in in Korea, come from the other units, he was like, I get it. Yeah. And so that was a full circle moment for me. That had to feel pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right. To know that the standards we brought with us from the regiment um, actually made a difference. And and the reality is all these guys went on to do great things, right? Uh, yeah. Bickle, Scotty Myers, Matt Schleich. Right. Right. All those yeah. guys went on to do a, amazing crushed. things, right? Yeah, yeah. So. And I think that's, yes. like, Kelly, you were talking about the, the guys now. I think I think it has, that mentality has kind of proliferated throughout the whole career field now. Like you were saying, like, at the, even at the 7th, you know, those guys are crushing. You know, I know I know the conventional tag P's nowadays are, it doesn't matter where you go or who you're talking to, they all just want to get after it. They're all in great shape. They all, they're all real motivated, which is kind of nice. Yeah. It's nice to see, I guess. You know, yeah, they're far yeah. superior shape than I was back then. <laughs> For sure. You know, I was just a skinny Same. little guy who could run and ruck, right? Knock right. out some pull-ups, push-ups, and sit-ups, and that was it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but these guys, man. Um, yeah. And, and so, so what's interesting is, is what you said about the, that whole philosophy mentality has – uh, it's, it's throughout the community now. And because I remember when I went to, you know, I cross trained in 87. And so you had the, the Johnny Kleber, the, the Ray J Carvalho, the play Christian down there. Yeah. Uh, oh, Randy long. And, uh, and so back in the day, if you saw a dude that had master wings and air assault wings, he was the shizzle. Right. 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 I mean, and, and I remember getting to Fort Stewart and some of the guys there were, they didn't, they didn't give a shit about anything, yeah. you know? They were just, you know, every every time they went to the field, it was a suck fest for them. Uh, no aspirations. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm looking left and right, and I'm like, well, hold on, man. There's all these opportunities for us. Yeah. I want to do this. I want to do that. And, and so I think, like, dudes like Marty, J-Mac, you know, because J-Mac was, th- like, 35 years old when he went through Ranger School. Right. You know? Yeah. Um, <laughs> And so you got these guys. I, I think we are at the at that the, the crest of the wave where we were starting to see guys push themselves and get more involved and, and become uh, just better all the way around. You yeah, know, there was a couple sure. guys um, up at uh, up at Campbell. There was a, a, a little guy named uh, Mark Arcirio, Arsar- and then there was Paul Ford. Yep. And, and as far as that conventional side, they were really pushing it, right? Oh, yeah. You know, they were doing the jump school. Uh, now, they weren't jumping up there, unfortunately, but they were doing it. They were doing the air assault. They were, in fact, I went to the air assault school up there, and they would come out and do the 12-mile road march with you. Nice. Right? Keep you motivated. Well, yeah. And the dudes right. at that, too, man, I didn't see that there. They, right. they weren't going to do anything more than they had to. Yeah, and yeah. so I, I like to think we are we are like at the the very forefront of, and and, and, and it wasn't necessarily us right place right time, yeah. right, right because you know we 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 fed off of each other. Sure. Um, yeah, that's what I was going to say. Like it could have gone the other way. Like you could have been negatively influenced by those guys who weren't really motivated and gone right. the other way. But it's uh, it was yeah. It's just. But I think it's a testament to how kind of how you guys like you and how Marty you guys are the kind of guys that would gravitate towards J Mac and towards the hard stuff. Whereas, you know, yeah. other guys may not do that. So. Yeah. And, but, but I, uh, as you said, I think that's changed for the whole career field. Oh, for sure. For sure. You know? I think they're all, they're all kind of like that. You can't even, yeah. you can't even find a guy who's not motivated anymore. Essentially. Right. I mean, they're, they're, right. They're, and, 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 and their combat ops that they've been exposed to yeah. relative to uh, Panama desert storm uh, or whatever, or the guys right. who went to the Balkans. <laughs> right. Right. Um, yep, yep. Uh, the, the shit that they've been involved in is just is mind blowing. Right. You know, so. Yeah, I know it's it's good to see. It really is. Yeah. So you went, so you spent some time at first bet, a lot of time. Then you went, did you go to the group? You went to the 14th after that. Well, I went to the, I went to the group and oh, the I group worked, I there. worked in, uh, in the, you know, the direct, I worked with the director of operations and I, I worked, I would, they made me chief of mobility. Okay. So what did that mean? Uh, it means I jet, you know, I worked with chief Rouse, jetted airplanes so we could go to Puerto Rico, <laughs> you know, and, and all we would do is with, uh, so units from other, like maybe 10th mountain division guys would come down 
uh, and or 17th ASOS guys. And I don't even mm -hmm. know if they weren't even 17th ASOS back then, I don't think. And, Why not? Uh, and we go, we would go down to Puerto Rico and they would go out to the OP to do close air support. And we would do jump ops to pay for the aircraft. Nice. And we just camped out at this place called Camp Garcia in a big old maintenance shed. And the reserve uh, Navy C, uh, uh, Navy uh, Seabees took care of us. Oh, cool. Yeah. Uh, have, you, have you ever been down there? I've never been down there myself. No, I never made, made it to Puerto Rico. Yeah. So we got so and, and what helped us is with the JAP missions was we were going down in February, January when it was cold. And so we'd get these northern tier C-130 units. Oh, OK. And uh, this airstrip on, on Camp Garcia, uh, one of the things we had to do, we had to go out there with machetes and chop off some of the growth. Oh, OK. And then we had to drive up and down to chase the wild horses off before they would land. Jeez. And, uh, and then, you know, so we're on the radio listening and the plane comes by, does a couple of flybys and uh, range control gives them all the winds and things of that nature. And then the last thing they say is land at your own risk. <laughs> so, so the plane Doesn't lands, <laughs> yeah, the plane lands and this old pilot gets out and he says, God damn. I ain't seen nothing like this since Vietnam. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the Puerto Rico trips were good. Yeah. Uh, I heard great things about them. Yeah. I hated missing them. I, it just, yeah. yeah, it was a really good time down there. And, and of course, when I was at battalion, we'd go over to Camp Santiago uh, over in the Salinas province near Ponce uh, okay. and get some good close air support training there. And um, used to the A state, I went there years, I went there probably 88 before I went to battalion with the 507th and we did a close air support with a seven. Wow. Okay. Um, and that was good. Those guys, those guys really knew their stuff. Yeah. I think the a seven, I think that was, that was the first cast control I had in Panama was an a seven. And then I didn't get any after that. I think that was like right at the end of them doing any either. I think they had, were phasing them out at that point, but yeah. But yeah. Yeah. And, and they were good though. Yeah. A sevens were wonderful. Yeah. A sevens, a fours, you know, and the thing about the Marines, they would come single ship. Yeah. Right. If they were taken off in a two ship and one dude had a maintenance issue, they didn't care. Yeah. They they'd come up single ship, no problem. So Yeah, they're real ground oriented that way where they're mm. well, we've got to support. Yep. Yep. So what you were mobility, the group, and then where'd you go from there? Yeah, so I did uh I was there for about a year and then I went down to the fourteenth as okay. the op soup and then Mark Valella uh, was the squadron soup and I was there for maybe a year and a half. Man, the two um, of you down there at once, that'd have been, that's, you probably had a phenomenal unit at that. I mean, what a great opportunity to serve yeah. on you guys. Yeah. So, so, uh, Bruce Floyd and Paul Thomas were there before us. Okay. And a couple of great dudes. Yeah. They had, uh, I guess they had some, some equipment logistics organizational challenges after Desert Storm. Okay. And so they were, they were, they worked all that minutia. And then when we got there, because it was all squared away, we just focused on training. Nice. And so Valella had, with his background, came up with some, we call, we send the guys home and then recall them. Okay. And then we go out and do training, you know, do uh, go out to Mott Lake and, and, and build poncho rafts and go swimming across the lake. Uh, Hal Sullivan, with all his field skills, setting up Yukon uh, stoves and things that, you know, all these kinds of, uh, and, and just bivouacking. Yeah, yeah. You know, just just get the guys out there, get 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 back to the fundamentals. Sure. You know, this this is what you have on your back. Uh, and so this is what you gotta make do with. Um so right. Valola did a did a bunch of stuff like that that was nice. really cool. And so we did that at the fourteenth, and then I ended up going to Saudi Arabia for two years. Oh really? Uh, yeah. I worked at the the Royal Saudi Air Force TAC P school in, in a place called uh Hamis Mushait. Um, what was that South, like? It was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so there were nine Lockheed Martin employees. Two of them were TAC P. Okay. Uh, it was, it was, uh, John Freeman and, and Joe Siebenberg. And I heard uh, of Freeman. I haven't, yeah. Yeah. Joe Siebenberg is a real smart guy with the radios. Okay. Um, and so the Saudis were, were trying to build a, a TAC P community at the time. They had taken all their combo dudes and they were training them and they were going back as combo dudes. Okay. Uh, and they were running a JFCC for the officers. And so I did that for two years. Um, 
life on the compound was good. The British were next door, and, and the compound was mostly uh, uh, McDonnell Douglas folks. Okay. Uh, helping the Saudis with the F-15s, you know, all former Air Force dudes, Mechanex, you know, hydraulics, sure, sure. avionics, whatever the hell. Uh, and there were nine military. Um, but, you know, I learned how to scuba dive. I got 65 dives in the Red Sea. Wow. So that was, yeah, that was cool. Yeah, beautiful place to dive. Um, yeah, okay. But, uh, yeah, I'll yeah, bet they so hooked I, you guys up. I'll bet they were, it was like just phenomenal. Well, accommodations. They, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. I had a 1,900 square foot villa all to myself. Jeez. You know, I had a, I had a, a, an, a suburban that was armored. You know, you know, like a like a three inch thick uh, windshield. It was crazy. Um, not that we needed it. It, it, and life was fine. Used to go downtown all the time, uh, no issues. Drive down to to the beach to go. You know, we spend six days there during during uh, the Hajj. Okay. You know, because everything shuts down for the most part. Sure. So we're just camping at the beach for those six days. So I just worked there with the Lockheed Martin guys, and um, I, I was on a traveling softball team. So I went to Dubai and and Dharan. Oh, really? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Permissive TDY, you know. Uh huh. So yeah, it was it was a good time. And then after that, yeah. back to the fourteenth. And you were the superintendent that time. You came. You I came back as charge. the superintendent, and uh, and of course uh, uh, that's when. Um, 9-11 happened okay. because I was there from 2000, 2002, then, uh, in that transition, like when we started sending dudes out, like, you know, the Buddy MacArthur's, the Max Porez's, uh, started sending all those guys out, uh, to support the SF. Right. Um, I think Max was there, but anyways, uh, so all those guys, we start pushing them out the door or not really pushing them out. They weren't part of my unit, but you know, see them off. Sure, sure. And then we actually did send like Buddy MacArthur was with the 14th, so he went. Um, and then in that time frame, I I moved up to the uh, uh, to the group, and uh, I think Art Boyer went down. Okay. And he took the 14th from there. I remember doing the um, the core warfighter exercises because the core was fixing the, you know, they're practicing for whatever they were going to end up doing. I do remember. Um, when Haytack and Price got fragged, you know, they got blown up. They yeah. sent me over to launch stool to be, or Colonel Longoria sent me to launch stool to be a patient liaison for them. Oh, okay. And so I went over there, got, got into the lodging. Uh, I got Jim uh, into outpatient status and just put him in a, in the billeting. Okay. And, but Mike's leg was all jacked up. So, you know, he had to stay in the hospital. Yeah. And so I just, I just tended to whatever needs they had. Okay. And, uh, then I, I, I arranged uh, the flight for them, you know, there was a medevac flight coming. So I just made sure they were on the medevac flight, Right. flew them into DC and then from DC followed them, you know, flew back with a commercial up to, uh, cause the medevac was a one forty one. Okay. And so we flew, uh, flew commercial from DC up to, uh, Campbell, you know, Nashville dropped them off there and, yeah, yeah, because they were supporting Fifth Group at that time, right? They were, yeah, they were supporting Fifth Group, um, and then they sent me back to Launch Stool uh, for Captain Wisher. If you remember the the grenade incident at the uh, at the Cabal, oh over yeah, in yeah, Kuwait, right? Yep. And so, uh, uh, so they sent me there to be a patient liaison for him, and so I go meet the guy and and. It, it was completely different there because now I'm driving back and forth from launch stool to Frankfurt airport to pick up his wife, to get okay. her settled into the Fisher house, which is a nonprofit organization. Uh, yep. they, they build these houses next to the military hospitals so the families can stay there. Uh, well, their, their service members are healing. Uh, and then I drove up and I picked up his parents, you know, then I drove up and picked up his brother. Uh, which, by the way, we had a great time downtown launch stool. That guy was a lot of fun. Um, and so that was different. And then one time I was in, I was, st I was at Al Yadid at our, our, what our wing headquarters. And there was this guy, Chief Levac, and he was from Alaska, but he was AFSENT command chief forward. So they hadn't really there because the AFSENT guy was still at Shaw. Okay. 
And so Chief Levac, he sees me and he's looking at my uniform, you know, and I got all the, the cool daddy scare badges. And yeah. he's like, what the hell are you? <laughs> I said, well, let me tell you who I am or what I am. I'm a TAC-B. And he had no clue. Yeah. Guy's a command chief out of Alaska, never heard of a TAC-B. Uh, yeah. And he says, so what are you doing here? I said, well, we got a wing headquarters and I, you know, I just travel up to Iraq to go visit all the different locations, see the fellas, see what's going on, what they need and all that kind of stuff. And he's like, Hey, can I go with you? I'm not going to say no. <laughs> right. I'm not going to tell command chief. No. Right? right. That ain't happening. So I'm like, sure, chief, no problem. <laughs> so the guy comes with us and we land at Balad and we're on those little, those little Haji buses, they call them. And, you know, I got my Alice pack, of course, but it, all these other Air Force folks got those A-bags. And so the chief's a little fella. He's, he's not, not a very big dude. And we're like, hey, chief, we got this. And the chief says, no, no, I want to help. I want to help. And we're like, okay, well, again, I'm not going to tell the command chief no. All right. And lo and behold, so he's on the steps. And as he's grabbing A-bags and throwing them off the bus, they're coming faster than he can move them. And right. he gets his foot caught between an A bag, falls, and 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 like breaks, dislocates his ankle. Oh my god! I'm like, oh shit! So <laughs> imagine if you're laying on your back and your leg is straight, but your ankle is twisted sideways. Oh, oh, jeez! So I'm like, holy shit! So we load him up, take him to the cache, and they got him on a gurney and they shoot him up with some pain meds. And I don't think they waited long enough myself. Yeah, yeah. And so he's on the gurney. They've got his leg lifted. One person's holding his leg up behind his knee. And the other person grabs that foot. And oh. they go, one. They're like on the count of three. And she's like, okay. And they go, one, pow. <laughs> and just oh, pop it God. into place. Oh. And, and I, that's what I did. I was like, oh, snap. <laughs> oh. So now I end up esc escorting this guy. Back to launch stool. Pretty interesting because. <laughs> oh, God. I, I mean, yeah, good on him for like trying to help out, but man. Yeah, yeah. Jeez. What a uh, and, and that was just a freak accident, of course. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, we, we fly down to, to Baghdad to buy app. Uh, then we get a plane. It takes us into, uh, into Ramstein. Okay. And then, of course, they, they shuttle us over to. Uh, to launch stool. And so I show up with him like, uh, what's up, fellas? And uh, all I've got is the clothes on my back and like a waterproof bag. Yeah, yeah. And I stink and all that kind of stuff. So I say, hey, the chief here, at, you know, absent uh, command chief forward, you know, busted up his ankle, uh, need to get him fixed up. I'm like, okay, go downstairs to prosthetics or, and, and, or the cast room or whatever the hell. Yeah, yeah. So I go down there and there's two civilians. And I'm like, hey, uh, we just got in from Iraq. I need to get the chief fixed up here. And they're like, oh, I don't know, man. We got a, we got a, an organizational day over at the ballpark. And, and I, I'm looking at them and I'm like, I, I do the old Villela. Stop. Stop right there. This man just flew in from Iraq. He needs to get fixed up. He is the command, the ascent command chief, and you need to fix him. And they're like, well, where's his crutches? Where's his? I don't know. We ran out of crutches in Iraq. I, what do you want me to say, buddy? This is, exactly. this is who yeah, we are. This is what we got. Do your job. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, so finally they fix him up, get him his crutches and all that kind of stuff. And so then I take him up to the wards to get him his inpatient. And they're like, oh, yeah, he... Um, He's, he doesn't need to be inpatient. He's outpatient. You know, you can go over to billeting. I'm like, okay, but the problem with billeting is they're doubling up people in rooms. And, you know, he, there's no elevators in the billeting, so they, they got to put them on the first floor. And the right. chief's like, I'm not, I'm not bunking with anybody but you, Sergeant Cross. Right? I was a senior at the time. He goes, yeah. I'm not bunking with anybody. So if there's no available rooms, I'm not going. And I'm like, all right, chief, I got you. And so... Meanwhile, this reserve nurse, Air Force nurse, she comes out and she sees me. Oh, hey, sorry, because I know her from the two previous times. Oh, uh, okay. So, hey, sorry, Cross, what's up? Uh, yeah, listen, this is the story. She's like, 
Oh, no problem. I got a room for him. Nice. And so, you know, that connection power, right? Yeah, for sure. You know, you know be nice to people. Don't be a dick. And uh, and it came around. And so Chief Levac got put in, in inpatient. And life oh, was good. Awesome. And one of the times when I went to, to launch stool for Haytack and, and Price, they put me in, in billeting over at Vogelway. I go into the room and I obviously I, I have a roommate and I'm checking out his kit. It was, uh, it was uh, uh, Lance McGuire. No way. <laughs> so his, his SF team, they had been pushed out of Northern Turkey. They're like, ah, we don't want you guys to go into Iraq anymore. So they, they ended up, him and his team ended up back in Germany wow. and Lance was my roommate. <laughs> what a coincidence. Jeez. Yeah. Yeah. What are the odds, right? Yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so that was that. Yeah. So the IUD and, and lot, uh, three trips to launch tool. Um, well, good on you. I mean, that's uh, that's an invaluable service that you provided. I mean, that's uh, those guys. I mean, because think about if they, they wouldn't have had a guy like you who actually cared and, you know, knew them or, I mean, I don't know. It just, yeah. it just seemed, I mean, that's, that's really good. They could have been out there just by themselves or with a stranger. I mean, that's, I don't know. That's yeah. Awesome. Yeah. And, and I remember when we, we, we landed in DC, uh, the air force medical unit there to like, Hey, we got a room in the, in, in our clinic or our hospital for Haytack. Right. Cause the guy's six foot a hundred. Right. And he's got a broken leg. Right? right. And, and Mike turns and looks at me with these puppy dog guys like, he just wants out of the medical, right? And right, so I'm, right. I'm like, I'm like, hey, listen, I've already made arrangements. We've got lodging. I said we're we're good to go. Well, are you sure? And I'm like, yeah, I'm sure, because they were like, they were fairly adamant that we that Mike stay with them. And I'm like, yeah. ah, Mike's good. Mike, are you good? Mike's like, yeah, I'm good. Um, and so we were able to get Mike over into lodging instead of having oh, to good, stay good. Uh, stay in a ward somewhere. You know, grab him a six pack, let him sit in the tub. Sure and just chill out yeah yeah, yeah. so but uh but yeah it was that was interesting in yeah. fact i when i went to when i was in a, in launch school i i am in this one room talking to the soldier uh he was from he came from iraq so that must have been uh when i went to see captain wisher and uh i'm like what happened to you dude he goes i got run over by a tank oh my god <laughs> So he was up towards Al Assad, and if you've ever been up there, the 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 it's like talcum powder, the the, oh, the dirt, dirt, and yeah, it yeah. just it literally pushed him into the ground. Oh, probably saved his life. Yep. Oh man. Yep. Did so, it run on his legs or his body I, or it's his torso, right? Oh my gosh. Yeah, and it just like pushed him into the dirt, man. It was crazy. Oh, he's so, lucky to be alive. Yeah. Oh my yeah. god. Yeah, and, and still on the launch tool thing, um, when I was at the 4th ASOG in Heidelberg and Valella was over at the USAFE mm-hmm. in, in Rammstein, he, uh, we found out about a guard attack P guy who had had a heart attack in Afghanistan. Oh, yeah. And so they sent him, and he was on an SF team, so they, they were able to diagnose it accurately. Huh. And they sent him to launch tool. So we go to launch tool to, to visit him. Don't know the guy, but he's a brother, right? Because he's a tech peer. Sure. Right. And so we're talking with them, introducing ourselves, you know, just yucking it up. And in walks the actor, uh, Vilder Valderrama. Remember oh, Fez yeah, yeah. from that 70s from like show? Like the 70s show? Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's a little feller, right? He's, he's not that big. But uh, so he's yeah, yeah. there on, on a USO tour. And, uh, and so he's got all his headshots and all that. So we meet him. We're talking, right? I don't even know if we had smartphones back then. So, you know, there's no selfies. Right, um, right. But he's got this headshot, and my wife Tanya is with Mark's wife uh, shopping, right? That's what they do. All right. And, and so I get this headshot from, uh, from Vilmer, and it says, To Tanya, thank you for last night. Hugs and kisses. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So interesting. Now that I, I guess we're talking about, it, I, I had some time in launch tool. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Fortunately, not as a patient. Yeah, yeah. No, like um, I said though, that's I, those guys were probably you being there probably helped immensely for those guys to heal and yeah. Just, and, and, and that was just, that was a Colonel Longoria advocate. thing, you know. Yeah. That was so, his yeah. Thing. That sounds like him. Yeah. 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 And and it was yeah, funny. He was always I got, thinking like that. 
Yeah. 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 He was, he was one of those guys that would think stuff, say it, and then you'd have to come back and say, is this what you meant? And he'd say, no, no, this is what I meant. And you're like, okay, got it. <laughs> right. But his mind was always, always working, you know, sure. working something, working this, yep. working that. So it was quite, quite interesting to work with that guy. Yeah. Yeah. And, and like, and kind of like to the point that you were there or had you go there, he was always looking out for the guys too. I mean, that was his number one priority was like, yep. are the guys yep. okay? You know, we need to get them the help they need or the kid or yeah. whatever it is. And very supportive, very yeah. supportive. Yeah. 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 So good times, you know? And so where were we? Yeah. So I went to brag the second time. So I went 14th, then I went group, uh, the whole nine 11 thing. I, but I never deployed. Oh, I did. I went to, I went to Kuwait. In 02, I worked at the Coic at Camp Doha. Okay. So I, but that was uneventful. I was there for 100 days. I was just an interim guy until another chief came rolling in. Okay. Uh, it was Rock Downing. So he, I think he came and replaced me. So, cause I, I, I forget who, I think I replaced Ames. Okay. And then I was, like I said, I was at 100 days there, interim guy, hanging yeah. out in Kuwait, having a good time. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, got to jump. You know, oh, really? Yeah, yeah, I was nice. there. Uh, the combat controllers were there, and um, the dudes supporting the SF were there. Uh, Excellent. So I got a halo jump and got a couple static nice. line jumps. So that's awesome. Yeah, why the hell not? Yeah, sure. So, and then what happened after that? Where'd you go from uh, from that assignment? Yeah, so from the 14th was Heidelberg. Okay. So the fourth A SOG, I was there for three years. Not really because of the deployments and TUIs. Sure, sure. Uh, so uh, simply just hanging out at, uh, at Camp Victory. Uh, yeah. I was there for four months. And then Valella went for four and I went back for four. Okay. And then I got replaced by Ken Zop when, when his when third, third ASOG came in. Okay. Uh, but that was, that was, I think, uneventful from my perspective. Um, just again, traveling throughout Ku uh, or Iraq to go visit the fellows, see what's up. Yeah, I mean, did, that, that, there's not much you can do at that level. I mean, once you reach at a certain level, and that's that's kind of your job, you know, you yeah. to watch out for everybody else. So, yeah, anybody that's trying to get in the fight at that level is kind of doing their guys a disservice anyway. So, I mean, it's yeah. you, you, you're doing what you had to do, and you know. Yeah, yeah I had a, I did have a guard tech P that was supporting the SF. Uh, he came, you know, because guys would come to. Uh, the Air Force house to check in, see if there's things we could do for them, get them stuff, order stuff. And this SF guy came and, and we got to talking and, and uh, he's like, Hey, you know, if you want, cause he saw, you know, he's again, the tab, the combat scroll, all that kind of stuff. And he's like, Hey, you know, if you want, uh, I can get you on a mission. And I'm like, stop, <laughs> stop. I, I, I said, I said, Small team tactics require familiarity. Right, right. Your dudes don't know me. Yeah. Right. My my muscle memory, you know, for anything close to CQB is is gone. Sure. I I can sling a mouse and I can work a spreadsheet. Right. But any of that tactical stuff that was a long time ago for me. So this yeah, is yeah. this is 2006, and I left battalion in '96. Yeah. Think about that. No, you made the right decision. I mean, I've always it never ever works out. Like anytime they ever try to bring like a senior leader on target, that you know it, they're they're just extra baggage at that point. It, regardless of how awesome they are, they could be the yes. you it could be a great uh, you know great warrior back in the day. But like you said, if you're not, I mean, you just don't know what they're doing. You know, so it's it's it can be dangerous. Frankly, I mean, I I, I thought as I thought as much too. And, and the guy, yeah. it was funny when he said. He said, okay, but there was like this sigh of relief. Like I felt, <laughs> I felt like he felt obligated to invite me. Yeah. <laughs> and he says, oh, that's okay. He goes, that's good. He goes, you know, because when we get these sergeant majors coming in from, from stateside to roll with the team so they can get their combat action badge or their, their CIB, right. um, he, he says, basically, we call them combat tourists. Right. Which is. It, I mean, it's true. It, it, yeah. And so yeah. I was just, I just was like, no, nah. no, nah, man. <laughs> Because no. I'd be that goofy son of a bitch that tripped over something or had an AD or, <laughs> right. you know, yeah. sneaking up, sneaking up on the bad guys and bang. Oh, now they know we're here. Right. <laughs> right. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. But I, I will tell you that what was interesting to me is as I traveled throughout Iraq, um, 
I think it was Balad that had the C.J. Soda uh, jock. And there was another Paul Thomas he, uh, out of Colorado. He was up there. I spent some time with him. Good dude. Um, but what I noticed was with the C.J. with the C.J. Soto guys, they would get intel, sift through it, say this is what we want to do, and they would go do it. Mm-hmm. What I noticed with the conventional forces, they were just they were just driving around doing what they call it uh, battlefield circulation presence patrols. Right? Yeah. And all they would do is drive around, then they'd get blown up. And as far as the adversary was concerned, that was that was the end of contact. That's all they were doing. Sure. Right? right. And then they'd do all these battle drills and come out and secure. And but once the explosion happened, there was no nothing they could do. Right. And I sat back and I thought, wow, why? Why are we doing this? Right? Because I'd gone to a ceremony for a couple of dudes who got purple hearts. Uh, and they were presented by General Thurman, who ended up becoming Fifth Corps commander. And I'm, and so I see that, and I'm like, oh, good on you guys. But then when I start thinking about it, I'm like, what are we doing? Right. Like, what's the point? What What's the point? Yeah. And so I talked with Colonel Bain, and, and I said, hey, sir, this is my observations. If these guys aren't going out on some sort of little named operation or, or a direct action mission where they actually have something to do, I don't think they should be out there driving around. And then we ended, I forget which unit it was, but, but there was a guy, General Bednarik, and uh, he was the division commander, and he called us to his office. And he says, uh, you guys are risk adverse. And I said, no, no, sir. I said, based on my observations, we're, this is risk mitigation. This is something completely different. Sure. There's no value. If, if you got a guy going out the wire and he doesn't have cast laid on for some sort of target, what are we doing? Right. And those IEDs, they don't necessarily have to be command detonated. I mean, it yeah. that guy could have laid that in a day or two ago. So yeah. you're not, even if you blow up and you do a battle drill, that doesn't mean you're going to find the guy that did it. I mean, he's yeah. long gone by then. So that's yeah, pointless. It, it was. And, and so what was interesting was we did this we did this mission up in Utah one time from, at first bat. And we lost a couple. We lost a helicopter oh. and uh, lost some dudes and to include the, the battalion commander. Oh, man. And so uh, we ended up, uh, this guy, uh, Bettineric, ended up being an interim battalion commander, uh, first bat. And so what was interesting okay. is I walk in, and again, huh. he looks at the uniform, yeah. and right away you got street cred. Right. Right? And then, but now you have to be able to articulate, right? You just sure. can't say no. <laughs> yeah. You have to be able trust to Trust me, I have all the stuff in my uniform. Just trust me. Like, no, no. Yeah, right. That's just to get you in the door. Now you have to... Say Correct. About it. Yeah. And, and so um, we said our piece. The general nodded and off we went. And we didn't hear about it ever again. Huh. Now, I don't know what happened when when third ASOG rolled in, how they handled right. it. But from my perspective, there was no value added in the guys going out on patrols if they if they're just driving around. Right. Right. At least have a target to go to or some sort of intel to action. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so that was, that was an interesting uh, situation. Yeah, yeah. But you know, and, and there you have it. So I yeah, think that's, yeah. that's as opposed to kicking doors, that was more my, my lane. For sure. Right. You yeah. Know, using working... all that knowledge that you've accumulated through this great career. Yeah. That's what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah. It's like advising the commanders to make good decisions on the battlefield yeah. for sure. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, so it, it was, uh, had its ups and downs and we did. So the Colonel at lunchtime would always, he'd worked over at the Alpha Palace and I, I worked at the Air Force house and at lunch he'd come over or after lunch, he'd come over and we'd have a cigar and drink a couple uh, uh, Beck's near beers. Sure. <laughs> and just sort sort through things. And we were out there one day with the weather officer, I forget his name. And all of a sudden, here comes some rockets, right? And so I get up and I run behind these sandbags that were put up because a few days earlier, celebratory round went through the Jace window. Oh, jeez. So I, I run and it went through the window, hit the curtain and fell to the floor. So it, oh, okay. it was at the tail end of its ride. Oh, thank goodness. And so I'm behind the thing, and I'm like, I got my beer, my cigar, and I'm hiding behind the bunker. <laughs> yeah. And I look out there. The colonel hasn't even moved. 
right? He, he reminds me like Robert Duvall in Apocalypse Now right? on the beach. And so what happens is, but the weather officer took off running and he ran inside and uh, the first sergeant comes out. He goes, hey, what the? Fuck? I said, man, these, these rockets came in, man. They, they came in freaking fast. I said, I wonder how fast they were traveling. And the first sergeant's like, I don't know, but not as fast as a weather officer. Because <laughs> that guy was gone. So, but yeah, we took, we took a, there was a few rounds, one next to the gym, uh, one next to Antenna Hill or on Antenna Hill, and one in the TCN village. Wow. So, yeah, I always hated those. Yeah. Because so, they're so unpredictable and you just never know. And it's, yeah, uh, yeah I hated the uncertainty of it. Yeah. Yeah, being up at Spiker in the in the defect with the fellas, and all of a sudden here goes the siren, and here this here goes the phalanx, right? And the next thing you know, you're running for a, bu- a bunker, and you're you're trying to eat your damn stroganoff, and freaking noodles right. and gravy are going everywhere. It's a freaking mess. <laughs> yeah. you, know? you don't want to throw it down because you want to eat it. So well, of course, I'm hungry. Know? Yeah, yeah, right, <laughs> right <you know>? exactly. <laughs> and if it's going to be my last meal, well, this is this is going to yeah, be my like... last meal. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so embrace the suck, right? Exactly. Uh, but you know, to me, that was all good times. I, I, I really enjoyed deployments. Oh, me too. I I really enjoyed them, you know? Yeah. Uh, And they were all different for me. Yeah. You know, every single one was different based on my rank, the organization I was supporting. Yeah. That makes it awesome because you don't get that monotony, you know, like, oh man, I got to do the same thing again. Yeah. Like you get, yeah. Yeah. That's cool. So so then, uh, so that was at Heidelberg and then where'd you go from Heidelberg? Vegas, baby. Oh, yeah. Nellis oh, Air that's Force right. Base. That's right. So I went to 57th Ops Group, uh, hung out there for a couple of years. I spent as much time as I could with the Ravens down at, uh, at Fort Irwin and the, fel- the fellows over at uh, JRTC. Okay. You know, And, of course, the 6th CTS was in the same building. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, so Gorski and all those guys. Um, Zagorski. Um, Reader was there. So yeah, it was a good time, you know. Um and it was Vegas, so yeah. there's that. <laughs> right. uh, and then, and then after that, I, I went over to the Seventh ASOS to finish out my final two years. I rolled in, and you you had uh, you had uh, Tim Pachesa was there, um, you had Pedro was there, um, and, and again, just uh, the the big thing there was just the unit was growing. Yeah. Right. So we were just trying to mold a new unit and. And send guys out the door and 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 uh, support the the first armor division as okay. they moved back from Germany and they started to grow themselves and and so that was that was interesting. Uh, yeah, you know, so you know Pedro Scott Losher, yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, but so th- so again a, a, a totally different uh, a set of tasks that had to be accomplished, right. right. Growing the organization, establishing relationships with the folks up at the Air Force Base there in Alamogordo, mm-hmm. um, Holloman, Holloman Air Force Base, right? Because that's where right. our guys went to. They went to ALS up there, right? Okay. They were in leadership school, so they went up there. And, that, and of course, that was a servicing MPF. You know, I was going to say, yeah, that you had to go up there to. That's yeah. the thing about us. We've always had to like travel to an Air Force Base to get all that kind of stuff done. Yeah, you know, usually. No. Yeah. And, and of course, we'd have to go up there to do our, our annual, you know, our weapons qualification, the Air Force one, and oh, then, right. the, then the other one. So uh, and there's not a lot up there. Oof. Not a lot up there. How was El Paso back then compared to right now? Like, I know it's a little a little more busy right now with all the border stuff, but. Uh, interesting enough, I remember we were in Germany when Pachesa got the assignment to Fort Bliss. Okay. And, and I asked him, I said, Hey, he, he calls me up. Hey chief, you know, Oh my God. Right. What's going on. And so I, I gave him some, some sort of, you know, rah, rah motivational speech. Yeah. And it must've been good. Cause it seems to have worked uh, fast forward a couple of years. I get an assignment to bliss. I'm like, Hey, Tim, I call him up. Do you remember that speech I gave you? Could you tell that to me, please? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> And uh, so, you know, I show up at Bliss and, and people were talking about the crime and the cartels. It was real bad. Yeah. yeah. But none of that was coming across the border. OK. Um, and likewise, now with all the uh, this immigration stuff, it's happening downtown. You're, you're not seeing it anywhere in town. 
Okay. It seems to be localized to the bridges where people are and where the CBP folks can round them up and, and try to bring them some of these nonprofits and hook them up. Okay. Uh, yeah, the news makes it look like, you know, El Paso is just flooded with people and ever it's just mass hysteria and no. which maybe some places it is, but I, yeah, I kind of want to get the straight dope from you to see what the yeah, real deal yeah, is. Yeah, we're not experiencing it. it, it you know, and, and the analogy is it's like any big city you go to, there's yeah. good places and there's bad places. Sure. And right now, it's a bad place only in the sense that uh, there's not enough uh, infrastructure and resources to, to take care of these people uh, to the standard that Americans are used to. Sure. Right. Yeah. Um, so uh, but it's a non-issue. And, and when back in the day, uh, when the. Air Defense Artillery School was here and the Sergeant Major course and all the support uh, functions, there was about 9,500 soldiers. Okay. Uh, they moved the Air Defense Artillery up to Fort Sill, and then they bring the 1st Armored Division in. And now we've got about 34,000 soldiers. Wow. Right. And so think about that along with the families, along with the extra contractors and civilian workers that have to support that. Yeah. And, and El Paso has grown exponentially. Sure. Uh, since we got here in 2009. Okay. Yeah. That would be, I mean, I'm sure that you had a huge effect on that, on the growth of that place. Yeah. yeah. Housing the whole nine yards, you know, uh, we used to be able to go out into the desert and shoot uh, our guns. And now we have to go further out in the desert. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so were they ready for all those guys to come in or do they have to like jump through their butts to get some housing put up or, did they do it on the on the base or how that how that work out? Uh, I think so. There's I forget the name of the company, but they're doing the privatization of all the the, the quarters. Sure. You know the houses on post, and and so they were in the they had a bunch of new ones, really nice houses, uh, solar panels, the whole nine yards. Wow. Um, makes sense. El Paso is called yeah. the Sun City. Uh, <laughs> I didn't hear of any any challenges at, at oh, good. as as the army came in. I think they they started to meet the needs. Okay. Um, I I don't I didn't hear about any horror stories. Oh, good. So. Okay. And so I just finished off my two years again. Uh, a, a totally set of, of circumstances and, and and responsibilities of establishing a unit, establishing. All that administrative stuff, right? You know, you, oh, yeah. the suicide prevention, uh, you know, the relationships with with uh, uh, Holloman. Uh, sure. You know, hey, this is who are you guys? Well, this is who we are. <laughs> right. Why are you down there? Well, because we support the army. You know, <laughs> that, yeah, that the yeah. same old story we've had to tell a thousand times. Same. Yep. And nobody ever knows. You think by now they would be aware of it, but yeah, it's you would think. get a rebrief from every time. I know. I know. <laughs> And so, and then that's it. And then I, you know, I, I finished my two years, uh, you know, I get an email and I love telling this to the army guys because their retirement process is so, so janky. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I get the email at, when, when I finish my 29th year, I get an email from the chief's group, Hey, or MPF. Hey, congratulations, uh, on, on a, on a wonderful career. Um, uh, you're going to have your retirement orders in the next week or so. I get the electronic orders and then I get the email from Holloman and all the out processing was done electronically. Yeah. Right. And I didn't have to do anything. I just checked my, the little link once a day and, and land mobile radio, green check library, right. green check. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. And places and you've probably never had, been to on Holloman. Yeah. Right. And they're just, yeah. they're just checking their records. I didn't even have to go there. Nice. And I love telling that to the army. Because these guys got to go everywhere still to out process us. And what a nightmare. Yeah. You know? And so I did. I ended, up, uh, I ended up working with the Army again as a contractor, just be uh, one of the associate professors at the SAR major course. And I did that. I thought that was years. so cool. I, yeah. I, when I heard you were doing that, I thought that was really how, – how did they I, – I always wondered, like, how did they receive you there? Were they like – did you go to the SAR major academy as, for a senior NCO academy? No, I was or? senior NCO academy. Okay, so and you. In fact, some, already some been of the kind of... civilian instructors who were army also went to the senior civil academy. Okay. Yeah. Hey, how did they receive you there? Were they like, was it open arms, or was it like, what's this Air Force guy doing, or what, you know, how it was that? Was, how did that? 
it was open arms. It was it was not oh, good. Issue. But here's here's the thing. When I was retiring, I was applying for jobs, right? All sure. kinds of jobs, USA jobs. Uh, when I went through the chief taps at Vegas, I realized what I'd been doing the last so many years was HR type. Yeah. So I have a business degree. I got an HR certification because of the taps when I realized. Um, and so I'm applying for all kinds of jobs and, and, and crickets, right? 30, 40 jobs. Yeah. Uh, I got two replies back. Uh, one from uh, Biltmore State in North Carolina. I applied for an HR job with those folks and one with the Gaylord Properties in Nashville. And I got a very nice letter back from them. Everybody else crickets. And so what happens is, is I invite, so if I backtrack, so about a year before I retire, the active duty Air Force instructor is at the SAR major course is, is retiring. Okay. And they reach out to me and ask if I can get some dudes in blue uniforms to escort and proffer at his retirement ceremony. Well, one of the dudes we just had roll in, a tech sergeant had just come from the Air Force Honor Guard. Oh, okay. And I'm like, tag, you're it. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. And so they go over and everything it, it works, comes together swimmingly. Right. And it's wonderful. Uh, and then so fast forward a year later, I send an E invite to this retired Air Force chief because now he's a contractor as an instructor. Nice. And he says, hey, he goes, uh, are, you know, are you looking at becoming an instructor or, you know, hey, we have instructor jobs open because they just opened 32 new positions. And uh, I'm like, nah, I'm trying to get an HR game, man. He goes, well, you know, send me your resume. So I send him a resume. So I get a phone call from the site lead of the contractors guy named Bob Kehoe. So I'm like, okay, I see where this is going. So I put on nice slacks, a shirt and a tie, uh, not a jacket because it's summertime, it's hot. Sure. And I go see him and I sit down and we're talking with each other. His sons attack P at, at the regiment, Dax Kehoe. I, I was, that name sounded familiar. I was like, wait a minute, no kidding. Yeah. So what his a coincidence. Son, yeah. So Bob Kehoe's, you know, he's an old, you know, airborne ranger dude and all that kind of good shit. Yeah, and yeah. so we're talking and he has my civilian resume and he's looking at me. He goes, do you, did you go to jump school or any of that stuff? I'm like, oh yeah, yeah. I, I did some stuff like that. And <laughs> yeah. he goes, well, put that in your resume. I'm like, okay. So I put it in my resume. I send it to him. And like 15 minutes later, I get a call from the president offering me a, uh, the, of the company, offering me a job. Nice. I'm like, here's your sign. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, and so I, I ended up uh, taking a job and, and open arms. Now, the the acceptance thing was with the students, right? Because uh, right, right. they're like, oh, an Air Force guy. And yeah. and not all the students, the combat arms dudes, right? Sure, sure. They're all yeah. like, Air Force guy, what the fuck is this, you know? Like, who's this guy? How does he know how to do yeah, yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, but then what happens is, is they end up, you know, just like our tech school, you have the bio out on the front sure. of the door of the classroom. And they read the bio and they come in and they're like, God damn, Mr. Cross, what the hell? Let's see. Yeah. <laughs> like some, like more than they have ever done. Yeah. Like uh, a lot of them. Yeah. Quite frankly, yeah. you know, and that's, yeah, yeah. that's the combat arms dudes, right? Sure. Right. You know, I, awesome. I, I, I can't tell you how many uh, 11 series dudes I saw with their CIBs and no tap. Yeah. And I'm like, oof, you know, but what are you going to do? So, so how long, how long were you an instructor there? Seven years. Wow. Okay. And then I had a year off and, uh, and I, I've been working, uh, curriculum development at the SAR major course now for, for four. Okay. And that's what you're doing right now. That's, that's what I'm doing job. right now. I, I, uh, I'll work two more years at the most until I'm 62 and then we're, we're moving to France. We're out of here. Oh, really? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. You know, change it up a little bit. Sure. Or change yeah, it yeah. up a lot actually. Yeah, a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> El Paso to France. Yeah, it's a quite so, a change. But I mean, El Paso has been good. It's a good town. Uh, sure. Once you get to know the downtown area, the city, that's a lot of fun. A lot of good, a lot of good eateries, good, some good bar hopping. Um, yeah, yeah. They got the, they got the baseball team. They got the soccer team. Nice. Um, uh, it's a, it can be a busy place if, if you're paying attention and, and looking for it. Okay. You know, I saw I saw Guns N' Roses and ZZ Top at the Sun Bowl. Uh, nice. or I, I don't know if you know Jay Regan, but uh, sure. uh, yeah, I've heard the name. I don't know yeah. if we've ever crossed yeah, paths. So Jay had yeah. come through here a few times, and we would hang out. And 
because uh, he was going across the pond to, you know, be a baller. And, okay. um, and so he had to do all his army training as even as a contractor. And uh, so we went over to the uh, saw Guns N' Roses, and uh, I've seen Jethro Tull downtown. Nice. You know, for those who know who Jethro Tull is, <laughs> I know. Yeah. So, but other than that, man, that's it. That's it in a nutshell. Well, that's awesome. Uh, do you have any? Uh, like, I always ask everybody at the end: Do they have like any initiatives or any kind of like um, programs or any kind of charities or any any kind of thing that you want to promote or you know you want to talk about that? Um, that people may not know about, uh, you know, like, like J Mac had, uh, the, um, Patriot rider, you know, that right. kind of thing, Patriot garden, you know, some other guys have had some other stuff. I don't know if you're in anything like that, or if there's anything that you want to. I, I did. Yeah. For, so for six years, I was a volunteer with the humane society of El Paso. Okay. Uh, my wife and I started volunteering there, you know, just working stuff with the kennels and the animals, taking them for walks, that kind of stuff. Um, and then, uh, after three years, they sent me a package to join, become a member of the board. And so I filled it out, sent it in and they said, Oh, welcome. You're, you're now a board member. And then, nice. um, a, a year later, I'm the president of the board or two wow. years later, I'm, a, I'm the president of the board. They're like, Oh, the, we, we voted and you're the president now. I'm like, what? <laughs> so, so I, I was with the humane society for of El Paso for, for six years. Okay. And so, uh, any any animal rescue organization, if you if you go to charity dot charity org uh, dot com or no charity dot org, I think it is, and okay. you can check their credentials and see how they're spending their money. Um, oh, okay. Uh, things of that nature. Um, so that, that's our thing. We we you know we have we had five dogs. We've got three now. Um, and then of course the Fisher House, right? You know, when, when you think about my time over at Longstool. Oh yeah, and, and all the good work that the people at Fisher House do uh, for the right. for the family members of the service members. So that that was a good one too. You know, other than that, and of course, you know, I, I get I get stuff from the VFW, so I, I toss them fifteen bones every now and then. Right, right, right. You know, and I'm a life I'm a life member with the VFW and, and the 75th Ranger Regiment Association. Okay. So, although I don't do much with that, I, and, and you know, you notice that most of the guys who work with these organizations are old, is because they're retired, retired, oh, right, 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 and and now they're staying busy, staying active, and staying engaged. Um, but I'm not retired, retired yet. So, um, yeah, it's kind of hard for it's hard for a guy who's actively has a job to get involved with those um, charities because it's it's almost a full time job at that level also. So com- good on you for even yeah. you know being able to do that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's, that's tough. Yeah. Well, Chief, I can't thank you enough for being on here. I really appreciate it. I mean, like like I said, when, ever since I first came in, I mean, you, you were one of those guys that I always looked up to and and uh, you know em- tried to tried to emulate. So I, I appreciate everything you do, you've done, and uh, appreciate definitely coming on here. I, I can't thank you enough. Yeah, I appreciate the opportunity. I love I love talking about. Uh, the old times with people from the old days, right? Sure, sure. Uh, other people just don't get it. It's not the same. Right. Um, and, and, and what's what's really been a fun thing is all the dudes who've actually come through here for various reasons. Yeah. You know, Sean O'Neill was here the other day. Lundquist is oh, really? Here. Max Porres, Gary Parks, Klukas, Valella. Um, yeah. Uh, Matt it's Schleich a laundry list twice. of heavy hitters for sure. Yeah, yeah. So all those guys have come here for various and sundry reasons, you know? Um, nice. And, and it's all and, and, and on the Facebook thing there, when I see dudes running into each other in, in the oddest of places, it just yeah, it really yeah. does my heart good to see everybody still staying in touch. Yeah. You know, so, I, sure. so I appreciate you actually creating this this podcast thing where you're reaching out yeah. and, uh, and talking to all the guys and, and, you know, just getting it out there. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like uh, like you said, I mean, guys that know you can take, check this out and see what you're up to, but also like for younger dudes, they can see where the career field came from, you know, like they can say, yeah. Oh, I didn't, I didn't realize they, that they did this stuff in first bat, you know, or, yeah. or whatever, you know, or yeah. in Germany or whatever. So yeah, we were yeah, one of the first history. organizations that were working with pilots, uh, in, in, uh, nods. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. You know, back in 92 working yep. with the A-10s and the F-18s from the Marines. Yeah. So, but again, if, if you don't know your history, you don't really understand where you're at, I think. Sure. Right. I agree. And, and again, like if I go to the hustlers right now to seventh, they're on the inside looking out. Right. Yep. But I've been on the outside looking in and those guys, I just look at them. I'm like, good grief. Look at these guys. 
they're they're amazing. <laughs> yeah. Right. They're just and then you 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 read stuff and and you know on some sort of website or YouTube or something pops up and you're like, good God, look at what these guys are accomplishing. Yeah, the career field has come so far. It's oh, just, and, and even the guys who ended up becoming command chiefs. Oh, right. Right. Yeah. You know, now the, the Klukas, Villela, I got it. They were the first ones. Um, but then, you know, you, you got the, the low shirts, the, the uh, you know, Pachesa, right? Who else did it? You, Tommy Case and, you know. Yeah, you, Kenny you know, Lindsay. Kenny uh, Lindsay. For uh, sure. You had yeah. Zach. Yeah. Right? Yep. Eddie yep. Morales, um, Weingartner, yep. Yep. right? All these guys. And they're not just like wing command chiefs they're they're going above and beyond that right right and so the, i i yeah. just look at these guys and i'm like or, or tim stamey running for political office right right yeah these, <laughs> these guys i just look at them i'm, I'm like oh my god they're, they're just yeah. crushing it Bef, you know crushing during it. and after right right and so I, that that does the heart good right yeah because because they they just didn't do missions and now they hang out at the nco club waiting for everybody to get back from the field to talk <laughs> tell war stories right they've right, moved right. on they've they, they still have a life. Yeah. Right. And I, 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 I mean, think, they're doing, not only are they doing stuff for the, they're giving back to the air force by bringing all that knowledge, but they're also doing stuff for the career field by exposing the career field to these, you know, higher level echelons. Yeah. Like experience, really, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. Good on you for, for pulling this thing together. And, and uh, right. who knows, maybe you could link up with uh, uh, what's his nuts and, and uh, 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 JT and Matt best and, <laughs> do something huge as they yeah, say yeah i i'd like to give max exposure for this thing i mean just because yeah. i like I, like i said in the description that there, there's so many of you guys that are have done such great things that like nobody knows about and i'm yeah. just trying to get the word out there like man there there are some some great americans in our yeah. career field you yeah. being included obviously yeah thanks sure. i appreciate that yeah likewise oh, yeah. so yeah so i i think well that's that's my story in a nutshell yeah, I appreciate it. Thanks thanks a lot for doing this. All right, man. This is awesome. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, no. Pleasure's all mine. I, I, I can't thank you enough for doing it. Yeah, well, keep on doing it. I will. I will. All right. Cheers.